Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. Dude, uh, the set? Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. It's awesome. Um, super exciting cards have been revealed this week. I think that we're going to be able to, to have quite a, a few amazing new cards to talk about and some new and old interactions to put together. And, you know, not to whet the appetites too much, but 24 hours or so from now, top of a podcast, we'll have our own preview card that no one has seen. Woo-woo. It'll be coming out tomorrow. So all that stuff is going to be happening this week on top of a podcast. But first, just wanted to shout out to Lilith Brooks. Lilith is one of our generous patrons over you, at Lilith. patreon.com slash top of a podcast. So thanks so much for supporting us, Lilith. Thanks to all of our patrons. And thanks for everyone who, who just tunes in and, and puts heart emojis on Twitter uh, next to our next to our posts. We, we love you all. And we love Ammon Cat. Where do you want to start? I, do you want to start at like the, the hella obvious place of like super format defining white cards, maybe Sacred Cat? Dude, I'm down for whatever. We got a few different options. Uh, I was like leading cat. into a different white card, but then I was like switching it into Sacred Cat. Yeah, I think so. What do you think about Sacred Cat, actually, you know, just while we're on it? Uh, like it, a good design, I guess. What do you mean, like, in terms of its power level? Yeah, I, I, I think it's an interesting card to talk about, just even briefly. Um, it would depend on the context, I suppose. If there was, if the format was just full of jackal pups and the like, Sacred Cat looks pretty good. It's kind of like a Doom Traveler, but instead, like, the front side has lifelink, In exchange for, like, you gain lifelink on the front side, but you have to pay a mana on the back side, and instead of flying, you get lifelink again. And, uh, I I mean, you don't get the human synergy on the way in. I think humans are way more supported than cats. And I think that uh, you get zombie on the back side instead of spirit. Remains to be seen how much support. But, uh... It's somewhat comparable in power level to Doom Traveler, I guess. It's probably worse, but it's not out of the question to be playable. I mean, Doom Traveler was a playable card. Yeah, so I, I hadn't thought about it in, in relation to Doom Traveler, but that is a pretty obvious point of comparison. Doom Traveler, I thought, was a pretty great card. It it saw a lot of impact in, in more than one deck. I, I like Sacred Cat. I think it's a a good little design. Um, I, you know, what's the name of that card? It costs like twice as much mana as this. That you get like a um, a one one red creature, and then if you don't pay the echo, you get another one. Basically, I was kind of comparing it in my head to that. That, that I think that there are probably a fair number of decks that would like a sacred cat uh, over the course of a history of time. I don't. Again, like you said, it it depends on the context. But I think that this is a sweet little stop sign if uh, people play like two ones and three ones, like you said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be okay. I just, I think it's the exact kind of card that uh, identify why you might be interested in it, and uh, wait until you have more context, because its baseline power level is, you know, it's not pushy, but it's not embarrassing by any stretch of the imagination. You know. All right. So let's move on then to a different white permanent. Costs three much, three times as much mana as Sacred Cat, or I guess less than three times as much, depending on how you how you value Sacred Cat's mana consumption. Gideon, uh, Gideon of the Trials. See that? I can see where you're going. With I, that. It, yeah, it was that. Was that a big surprise? This card was spoiled like hours before we started recording. I actually didn't know it was there, and then somebody tweeted me. Can't wait to see what you guys say about Gideon on on Twitter. So, if you want to influence the future, you just you know, uh, twitter.com slash top of a podcast. You can, you can influence the future by saying things like that to us. What do you think about this guy? So he's one white, white for three loyalty planeswalker Gideon as if we didn't have enough playable Gideons. Right. And he's got three abilities, uh, as is typical for Gideon. doesn't have a real ultimate, but this one seems pretty ultimate, right? So he's uh, plus one until your next turn, prevent all damage target permanent would deal. Seems 
interesting. Um, zero until end of turn. Gideon of the Trials becomes a 4-4 human soldier creature with indestructible. That's still a planeswalker. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to him this turn. So the very you know typical Gideon the soldier, indestructible soldier ability that we see on, on, on Gideon cards. And then his third ability is also zero. You get an emblem with, quote, as long as you control a Gideon Planeswalker, you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game, end quote. So this is a an ultimate-ish thing that you could do just the turn you play Gideon in the Trials. So And not even lose it. Yeah. What do you think? This card is it's a head-scratcher for me. I, it, it seems really powerful. That's, that's my first blush. The first thing, my first blush when I look at this... You know, because he's all posed all like, oh, look at how, you know, this is a great angle for me. The first thing I think of is I just picture Gideon going, meow, meow, you know, like with Sacred Cat. <laughs> I, it, not for any, like, super productive reason, but that's the first place my mind goes. Yeah. And I just call him like I see him, you know. Maybe is it because of, like, those banners that are off to the top right are kind of reminiscent of the cat scratch? Do you think that might be it? Or maybe well, I don't know. just talking about Sacred Cat and those things together have influenced your brain away from perhaps the tournament playability of what is obviously a pushed Planeswalker, right? Three casting cost Planeswalkers have a heck of a resume over time, right? You know, from the days of Jace Bellerin to Liliana today to Nyssa, they, they tend to get played. So when I look at this card, the uh, first thing that uh, I go to is a is like so many planeswalkers, the middle ability. And uh, I think for Gideon of the trials, the middle ability, his middle zero, uh, is the uh, that's like sort of the starting point for understanding this card. Uh, if you are using the zero ability exclusively, like if the card only had the middle ability, it would be a four four indestructible on your turn and on your opponent's turn it would not only not block but it also uh is very vulnerable you know it takes just three damage four if you plus it at the beginning but because you're not really going to attack you know i mean you're not going to really do the middle zero the first turn you play it you might do the bottom zero but the uh the a four four that's like so unstoppable on the front side, but so vulnerable on the back side. It's at least interesting, right? Like it's a it's a Luxodon Smiter that doesn't count as a creature spell if your opponent plays Essence Scatter, which was you know revealed. The returning this week. Essence Scatter that's going to be a card that gets played. I think. Yep, and then it doesn't count as a creature until it's indestructible. So if somebody has a creature kill spell in their hand that's not, you know, it's just destroy a creature, then it never destroys Gideon. And uh, it doesn't take any... I mean, so I, I don't know. I think that that already is, like, attractive, right? Like, it dodges uh, Wrath of God type effects, sweepers. Like, that's a very appealing thing already, so I think that the middle ability alone is good enough to make the card a constructed candidate. See, I think it's interesting that you went to the middle ability. This is such a... It's very similar, you know, whether it's similar in cost, but similar in effect to most Gideon abilities, right? That plus one is... I think this is an amazing ability. It might well, complete... It I, is. I think it's amazing, not just, like, pretty it good. Is. I don't know. I'm with you 100%. I'm saying that the the top ability is uh, a trickier one to evaluate, and when you already have the lens of the general utility ability, like the middle is good all the time. Like it's just like a baseline. Here's a good thing to do. The top, however, synergizes so perfectly. Like they're, they're like peanut, like they're like opposites. In, but they're, uh, which is great for options. When you're under attack, Gideon protects himself from anything. He's an icy that not only doesn't cost mana, he also uh, gains loyalty in the process. 
and he is he can icy uh, planeswalkers even. He could icy uh, uh, any anything from a planeswalker to a land. I mean, you can even do this to your own permanent if it's a permanent that would do a bunch of damage to you. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. That is also interesting. Like you might in, you might set up some kind of a crazy combo or something, but the uh, the the fact that the middle ability is like if there was a card that was just four four indestructible <laughs> for three, you would play be, it right. <laughs> it would be absurd, right? Like it's obviously <laughs> broken in half. Now you get that on the front side, yeah, like, or you get that when it's Nemesis is like worse than that. The thing that you just, <laughs> you just definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, described, and that's basically then, Gideon, right? And, but Gideon, when you if you want to use him offensively, that's what he's like in many ways. And if you want to use him defensively, while he doesn't kill things the way the four four indestructible would, he does stop. Any attacker, even a flyer or an unblockable creature or a planeswalker or anything, right? And he gains loyalty in the process instead of costing you mana like an icy. So I th- those two abilities, it's so either you can press or you can uh, you can defend. Both great. The top ability seems more powerful in terms of output on the game but the uh, middle ability seems always good whereas the top ability is frequently wasted well it's wasted in the sense that like having a doom blade in your deck might be wasted right it's well, no no just on a turn oh no okay. no, no I, i'm saying just per turn it might be great again next turn what i'm saying is that uh the middle ability is great basically Every spot where you don't want the top ability, the middle ability is good. Crash for four. Right. So here's here's my take on, on the top ability. I have three I have three initial thoughts on the top ability. One, old hack need, everybody always asks this question whenever a new planeswalker is revealed. Well, does it protect itself? I don't. Okay. Ever X minus one humans ask if it protects itself. Pat my mother nice. doesn't. Um, this is a heck Shout of a good my job. Mom. I love you. Uh, Not you. I mean, you I do too, but I mean, uh, yeah. my mom does. Also, shout out to your mom. She's a, a lovely person. Yeah, so the top does this. a great job. It of does protecting. a great job of protecting itself. So it actually just checks off the first box there for Planeswalkers. Secondly, if you think about the kind of defense that this card puts together, I'm actually not sure if it's better against tall or wide. And I think that's a really interesting thing to be able to say about any magic card, right? So if you think about context in the game, you know, at the point that you're playing Gideon, say if you're playing it on curve, it's like turn three, how many threats does your opponent even have? Tall. Tall. The answer is it's better against tall. It's, I mean, it's phenomenal against tall, right? Like if, if you're tr- playing against a deck that like tries to win with one threat, you know, and most traditional control decks are trying to win with like one Dynavolt Tower or one... Uh, you know, a uh, torrential gear hulk, or you know, back in the day, it was like a Sarah Angel or one consecrated Sphinx, anything like that. Like, it's insane against a deck that only has one way to win. Some of these decks have like two ways to win total in their deck. This right? is such a weird way to look at it. <laughs> so, like, I think no, I'm just thinking about the applicability of a card, right? So, that's one thing which is spectacularly powerful, but the thing that's subtle about it is it's insane against wide. Because if your opponent has one threat, like one small to medium threat, he can't get through. So he has to play more things. So he plays into a situation where you're always capable of generating card advantage. Gideon no, that's is- not what wide is. No, 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 no. When I think of wide, I'm thinking like wide. I mean, yeah, he's double not, wide. I mean, he's no better against 100 tokens than he is against two or three medium-sized creatures. Yes, I agree. He's actually substantially worse against 100 tokens. I, I maybe I misused the term wide. So what's better? It, like, it, would it be better against a deck that has Tarmogoyfs and scavenging oozes and so on, or would it be better against a deck full of like hordling outbursts and well, it's much better against Tarmogoyf scavenging ooze than hordling? Right, outbursts. that's because it stops one target. It's good against tall. 
So I was thinking as a standard card, one of the things that's great about it is if people have, you know, medium-sized threats, which they often, let's say the Mardu deck is all small to medium-sized threats. Uh, Black-green decks are like medium to large-sized threats. You're putting out, you know, some number of threats. It's forcing the opponent into a position where they're playing into your Radiant Flames, playing Tendrils. You That's know. the icy manipulator yes. aspect. It's fantastic from that perspective. Because it's just basically a card advantage. Like an, an actual cardboard advantage machine when played in context. And so, I don't know. I, I, find, I find that first ability to be incredibly impressive. You find the second ability to be incredibly no, impressive. No, 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 no. I didn't say the second ability incredibly impressive. The second ability to me is uh, incredibly straightforward. It's and just... It's, I'll it's say it's I, impressive. I, I think I it's quite the, impressive, I think too. the first ability is more impressive. Second ability is really good, too. Definitely. The second ability is more reliably good. Okay. And it's a good thing that he has these two great abilities. <laughs> you know, because that makes it a good Planeswalker. It has, it has some good abilities. The third ability... We've never seen a card like this before, right? Like, this is like a new... Like Platinum of, Angel? Yeah, it's like a conditional Platinum Angel. I guess well, Platinum Angel is inherently... Is, is it just the same? It's, it's, it's kind of like a Platinum Angel. But it's an emblem, right? It's... Well, no. No, it's it makes all your Gideons into Platinum Angels. The emblem is not Platinum Angel. It just makes it so that all okay. of your Gideons are Platinum Angels. What do you think? It, it seems really interesting in terms of what kind of applications you can put against it, though. Right? Like In what way? Here's an example. Let's say there's like a, a format where um, a po- an opponent's playing a combo deck of some kind, right? But like their combo deck is like a big thing, like a lightning storm or like a brain freeze, you know, something like that, where there's or tendrils, something that's just hitting you, and their deck right. might not have a way to remove a Gideon Planeswalker from play. Like it might oh, not yeah. be there. In their in legacy, seven, yeah, like it's just not in there. legacy in their that bottom ability. Game. Yeah, this Planeswalker seems well set up for Legacy, or possibly Vintage, but more likely Legacy. If you put this thing down in Legacy, there's a variety of decks that just can't win, or it's exceptionally difficult. You know, like, maybe they have one Chain of Vapor somewhere in their deck, I don't know. But, but like, Modern Ad Nauseam has a hard time, right? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Very, very hard. And uh, it, I think the other abilities are better than they might look on the surface, for for legacy uh, anyway though like uh locking down one permanent is actually like it can be quite good against tarmogoyf you know like it's it's a real thing to put down gideon and have an answer to uh to even just like your opponent's creeping tar pit or something just random stuff right and the ability to put down a gideon when your opponent is playing like for instance jace the mind sculptor Jace can't interact with Gideon profitably. Not super profitably, oh, anyway. Gideon can interact with Jace. Gideon can interact with Jace. That's true. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I think it's going to be kind of interesting, the, the fact that the bottom ability might give this card a little bit of a lease on life in powered formats with a lot of combo kills. You know, like, you can, you can actually target, um, like... I mean, it depends. I guess not, there's not that many. A lot of the combos end up going wide and beating it. So, I, But I do think there are some spots where the bottom ability will be meaningfully relevant. The reason why the bottom ability probably doesn't do as much as it might look on the surface is because typically, like if somebody's just playing a normal game of Magic, whenever they could kill you, they could also attack Gideon. Or damage Gideon, or whatever, right? Like, how are they killing you without being able to kill Gideon? Because it doesn't prevent the damage to you. Your life total can drop into the negatives. It's not like, okay, well, Gideon was in play, and now Gideon dies in combat, but you didn't take any damage, or you're at one, or whatever. You're just dead. So... My guess is that the third ability is not going it, to... It's... I mean... Who knows? They'll probably put some kind of weird, freaky combo deck in, right? But, like, for instance, it doesn't help you against Copycat because they attack 
like they send, I don't know, like eight or nine hundred million at Gideon and another eight or nine hundred million at you. And then you go to negative oodles and then they uh, kill Gideon and you die. All in one turn. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's great against copycat. And I actually don't think the third ability is so great against conventional decks. I do think if you're in a tight situation or a race situation, this can throw a monkey wrench into people's standard operating procedure. And, I agree with that. And I think that this is going to be backbone of a new way of playing standard. Like, a way, or not maybe not new in like the capital N, N way, but like a way that we haven't seen people play standard in months, if not years. Like, where we're just creating an incentive to generate card advantage on the board, play controllish cards, and actually conveniently bundle a way to win in a single card. You know, it's kind of nice how effective it is against Heart of Kieran. It's like, like not, not only does it Heart of Kieran. That's not only does it stop Heart of Kieran from getting in and attacking you yep. in a way that uh, the other the Gideon Four never could. It also can uh, it it kind of like locks them out because it's isolating the le- the legendary Heart of Kieran and they can't play their other ones. Oh, that's so awesome. Right? Like that's yeah. pretty good. I love that. I think this card is I think this card is uh going to be very popular. And I think it's going to see some legs in multiple formats. It is funny. You know that Gideon back from like uh Return to Ravnica block that would just get like plus one loyalty for every creature. Uh, and like sometimes he would just end up with like 18 loyalty or something. Did he like gain life equal to his loyalty? What was his it would, just, it would just gain tons and tons and tons of loyalty. And it's funny the way that that one interacts. Gideon Jura used to do that too sometimes, where it's just like, okay, I guess Gideon has 30 loyalty because there's nowhere to spend it. That's pretty sweet. Well, I think this have... guy is going to have a big stack of loyalty sometimes. Yeah. But you could you could have just used all the abilities. There's just nowhere to actually deplete the loyalty. I mean, well, I no, think, it, it happens they're... that the two are, if you have your Gideon of the Trials versus your opponent's Gideon of the Trials, the two of you might just keep plus one-ing each other's Gideon. I, I think that it is interesting because if you have Emblem on three, then the plus one actually helps the survivability of Gideon, though. So, you know, it depends on how big your opponent's threats are. But, you know, it, he's both gaining loyalty so that it's harder to remove him from play and then also eliminating damage from one of the threats. So that also helps his survivability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what do you think? Is this the uh, the second best uh, white card revealed so far? The second best white? I think, I think... Or do you think it's first? I think it's first. Okay. What did what did you think is uh? What's the other? Uh, are there any other white cards that jump out at you? I, I think that the fact that uh, team top levels preview card even mind sensor is a is a mainline card in this set is worth noting, right? That's that's a, already a cross format staple, and it'll be interesting to see this in in standard. Is there a lot of searching? Traverse the Ulven Wild and a tune with Ether Those are, are two two heavily played cards. <laughs> Yeah, those are those are two of the really big ones. Yeah, those are those are a big deal. So, uh, and evolving wilds to a lesser degree. Um, yep. But what do you think? Do you think uh, even my sensors will see heavy play? Maybe it's not like, the heavy, but it'll see some. I mean, it's still a two-one flying flash. Too. You know, at the end of the day, a two-one flying flash has applications, and uh, the fact that it's a potential option against the tune with ether and traverse, both of which have been so popular recently, I think it'll show up a little. What, sure did, so. what did you think as a uh, if you thought that Gideon was only the second best white card? I didn't say that. I asked if you did. Oh, I, I was just checking, bro. I like Renewed Faith. Man, that's a good card. Renewed Faith is your one? No, it's my one. Dude, what about Cast Out? <clears throat> so, how is this not just like the most Floresian? Like, don't get me wrong. Obviously, like a three-three vanilla for three. Or, like, actually, there's a different card we'll get to uh, later that I think has just your name all over it. But in the meantime, I mean, isn't this just, like, like, this is, like, this is the type of card that butters your bread, right? 
I mean, I, 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 I love it. It has cycling W, right? It's <laughs> like I. There have been times in the this past. Is where I love. I love opt. You know, <laughs> you would just play with a, like a, like the most horrendous card if it had cycling of one, right? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm heavily influenced by Osip Levadovich. He he convinced me. Was it Chroma's blessing? He just never yeah. did anything in his deck. All it did was cycle for one. It's like I wouldn't have won the Pro Tour if I didn't have that card. It's the best cycle cast, for one. So cast out is three and a white enchantment with flash. When cast out enters the battlefield, exile target non land permanent and opponent controls until cast out leaves the battlefield. And it has cycling of white, which means obviously you can discard it, pay a white, and draw a card. So I love this card, obviously. I, I probably was guilty of, the of in the whole planet, overplaying Faith's Fetters the most. So Faith's Fetters was a non flash forecasting cost and chance. You actually might be. I'm trying to I, I think back. I'm like I number one. I can't Faith. even conceive of who could be competitive with you. Like, ah. Oh. There's a spare slot in a deck that might be able to get a Sacred Foundry or Temple Garden? Let's sideboard fourth face betters. <laughs> okay, so, th- so this is... this is Let's set aside the, the design. <laughs> because uh, the design is a little bit offensive. <laughs> like, if you thought Thoughtseize was a questionable design... Wait till you get a chance to play with cast out. Because you know what a situational, like, obviously, like, a situational card has this new meaning with cycling. Well, what if the situation is they have any non-land permanents and that you might want to get rid of them, even at instant speed with a card that has only a single colored mana? No, no, that's not what you're into. Well, then maybe you could just cycle the card away for one mana. What I like about this card is it doesn't make you pay three life. That's a great feature. That's, that's, that's a powerful feature. And B, for the mere additional cost of of one, kind of, uh, I get to just discard it for one if I don't want to nuke one of my opponent's permanents. But you could just like get like a Planeswalker that's about to go... About to go uh, uh, public, you know, IPO or whatever, or ultimate, and you can just get a big creature, or you can keep yourself alive, or 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 like an Aether Works Marvel, or like this just gets an Ulamog, right? Well, it it can. This is so. This is an O ring. Like this is like a Banishing Light. Really, this is a Banishing Light that for one mana more, you gain flash. And the ability to cycle it. It's like, uh, that's really, really good. Right? Like, compared to Stasis Snare, which also has Flash, Stasis Snare is a ubiquitous, that's a very, that's a popular card at most points of this standard. Yeah, it's right? like, like, it's like, the best deck in the format often just played three copies main deck. Well, not the current best deck. No, but no, no. But past for yeah. yeah. The, past, like, uh, the best deck of some version so, of the standard. So for one mana more, but an easier to, you know, easier on your colored mana if you're playing two or more colors. Easier on your colored mana, for one mana more, you can also hit artifacts, planeswalkers, enchantments. And also you can just pay a mana to discard this card and draw a new card. Anybody who's ever had a stasis snare in their hand against, like, a Jeskai Torrential Gearhulk deck, I'm sure you can imagine how nice it would be to have cast out. It yeah. breaks up the, the Sahili Rai combo. It can interact with, uh, with Flash. It can interact with, like, Archangel Avacyn, for instance, without you having to let them untap. It can deal with troublesome uh, enchantments. You know, like if somebody plays the Drake Haven that I'm sure we'll cover later. But there's so many things this card does. And the opportunity cost is so low. I mean, it's actually best friends with Drake Haven also. It's that's, that's the other really thing. They are friends best friends. <laughs> so, yeah, this is probably going to be a popular card. And it really increases the value of disenchant type effects, you know? Because uh, you already are just like really interested in disenchant effects. We were seeing a lot of the uh, reactive decks playing multiple disenchants in their main deck. 
Well, now there's even more reason to, you know, there's even more juicy targets. Um, how dumb do you think it's going to be? Do you think there's going to be a lot of cast out versus cast out fights? Uh, I don't know. It's, it doesn't really get dumb until it loops. You see, like, it's not optional. So, like, I could cast out your cast out that was casting out my cast out, and when your cast out comes back, you cast out my cast out. Like, I'm sorry, so it's like, uh, I cast out your cast out, and that unlocks my other cast out, which now, I guess it doesn't matter. I guess there's not, it's not going to loop. It's fine. Anyway, I don't think it'll be dumb. I just think it'll be different. This card's powerful and will be an important one for understanding the format because it changes the rules of engagement in a very fundamental way. When I think about Dynavolt Tower. This is like so many more answers to Dynavolt Tower for decks, you know? Yep. So, do you want to just jump over to the Drake Haven, or do you think there's some sure. permanent? Why? Th- so. It's not really a permanent, but it does feed, you know, lead up to some of the same stuff with Drake Haven anyway. This card to me screamed Michael Flores when I saw it. Cast that? Scar- Scarab Feast. So, which one's Scarab Feast? Sorry. Scarab Feast is black for an instant. Exile up to three target cards from a single graveyard. And this card has Cycling of Black. Oh, yeah, I've... I, yeah, I've... I'm in love with that card, of course. It's right. It's, it's card- three times as good as cards that I would have Vampire tutored for. <laughs> like, literally, I would have spent a card and two life to go get a card that just cost me a card, and I would have been happy to do it. And this one is three times as good as it. It's an instant, and it has cycling for B. One mana cycling is so powerful. You know who told and- me how good one mana cycling was? Is it still us? Also- it's you. Because when we used to play Mental Magic, you could just take any of your non-blue cards and then transform them into blue cards by cycling them, and that would just well. Make the best you, though, make you your also got and fill your graveyard. You also got You also want to cycle your your Pendrel Drake, or what looked like a Pendrel Drake back when we used to have graveyards, and then you can actually just flash back deep analysis. That's yeah, yeah. where the money's at. All that stuff, man. That that's you know the the. The speed, the utilization of any color of mana, it's a... Yeah, this card is awesome. And it's also Best Friends of Drakehaven. I I think Drakehaven is going to be so popular, it's going to be like, you know, the the captain of the football team. Everyone's going to want to hang out with Drakehaven, I think. Yeah, well, so Scarab Feast, before moving over to your BFF Drakehaven, the Scarab Feast is... um, Outside of just being, uh, you know, a one, a one cost cycling card, that this is like a very potent, and this is like you could potentially do this in modern, right? Like, this is a graveyard hate card that you could literally main deck in your Grixis deck if you wanted. And what's kind of sweet is you can cycle it and then flash it back with Snapcaster Mage to use as a hate card if I- you need to. I was actually thinking about it from a different angle, which is, you know, we talked some, probably months ago at this point, about potentially doing a Black Splash in Boros, where, you know, I, I've rejected green a long time ago, but you're like, hey, what do you think about black? You know, Fatal Push seems like a really potentially interesting card uh, to play in a, in a Boros sideboard. It kills Tarmogoyf, it does a lot of work for you. And of course, if you're playing black, you can bump, right? So playing bump in the night... Gives you, you know, a whole other set of, of lava spikes, and in weird, weird long games, you can actually even flash it back, which is not not the general thing you want to do, but it could happen. It's like, but you know, just having more lava spikes might be cool. The <laughs> this okay. seems like a really cool card to have in in your sideboard in a situation like that. I would be surprised if you want to play Scarab Feast in your lava spike deck in the sideboard. Yes. This card is not about being like it costs me, dude. You could do so much better. You're paying for the utility of cycling this card for one mana. 
A lava spike deck doesn't appreciate that. I played. They don't appreciate anything. Yeah, I played uh, Relic of Progenitus last time. Maybe Relic of Progenitus is just much better than this. I think so. All right, I can buy that. I still think it's cool, and I think maybe your it is cool. idea with Snapcaster Mage is better than mine. It could be used for no, no, no. It's idea. just you could, you could use it a variety of ways. I just think that you're gonna want to get some value out of being in the thick of it. You know, like your creature's rumbling with their creature, and then you shrink their Tarmoglyph by making... You know, I don't know. There's lots of stuff you I can do. I just love the idea but, of just taking out multiple prized amalgams. I mean, like... Yes. Everybody's going to hit by, like, too. all the prized amalgams at once. It's just... And Scrappy Scrounger. Just and Haunted it. Dead. All that. Get them all. Relentless Dead. Anything. They all, all deserve that. it. And, uh, of course, you could just go hit a bunch of people's, like... Uh, aftermath cards or their embalm cards. You know, you're not always going to want to do that, but it's kind of nice that this option is like so low opportunity cost. And this is like a very, very potent weapon, very potent weapon against Grim Flare. You know, or if your opponent casts uh, an Ishka and a Graph Widow, sometimes you just go Scared Feast in response. Oh, just like preemptively kill all of their spiders. Spiders just were, were never born. Right. And so uh, I, I, I think that's interesting. But actually, on the Delirium front, um, uh, you know, Scarab Feast could help this a little bit. But the uh, one other little utility piece of Cast Out that we didn't really touch on is how effective Cast Out is with Delirium. Because often enchantment is a very difficult type to get into your graveyard. Oh, wow. Cast Out lets you not only get enchantment into your graveyard, which is one of the hard ones usually, it lets you do it at instant speed, uncounterable for one mana. I love it. I actually think that's going to be fantastic for like, I think so. for like Green White, you know, this isn't a popular deck, but it's a deck that I was playing. Uh, like Green White Delirium, um, Marvel type decks, like getting an additional type in the graveyard is one thing. Also, we had, we had, we had a lot of debates about whether you wanted point removal at all, you know, if you were going to, or just rely on, on your big spells or, uh, or or how to approach that. And it just also digs you to your big cards, right? Like this is just, you know, uh, uh, like the, the world's worst amount of consultation, right? But it still gets uh, <laughs> the really the world's worst amount of consultation, but it gets you a card deeper to your, to your Marvel or your, whatever you want uh, to, to be answering, you know, your descent upon the sinful, whatever you need. It also just helps make your, your green white deck that wants to traverse for like Verderous Gearhawks or Archangel Avison or something, it gives them a little bit better option of that. It also helps power up. Uh, I don't know if this is even like a real thing, but well, a real deck. But like Descend Upon the Sinful, one of the things holding it back has been that it's hard for a blue white control deck to get Delirium. But Cast Out increases your ability to do that much, much, you know, like Sorcery and Instant, obviously easy. Evolving Wild, where you land on stuff like Evolving Wild. I think land is not going to be a problem soon. <laughs> cycling lands, yeah. cycling lands, no question. Uh, I I think that Cast Out changes the dynamic a little bit with regards to what kind of Delirium cards you can play. So, um, actually, before we get to the Drake Haven, just uh, just because we just mentioned the cycling lands, I uh, you said last week that if there were just the original Urza's Saga cycling lands that some interesting things might be happening in standard. These cards are literally twice as good as those cards, right? So I don't know about the word literally in this statement, but if you mean figuratively, yeah. They are functionally twice as... Uh, actually, yes, they're functionally only like 50%. So you're they're saying they're like, they tap for blue, blue, and you can like... What, is it is it that you can draw two cards for two minutes? Okay, they're, I get it. They make much you better than much better. Much much better than I agree with that. They are much better. Whatever Not only do they tap two for two colors, them being uh, a, like for instance, irrigated farmland is both a plains and an island. That's amazing. That's so good. Like obviously, the first thing people think of when they think of uh, duels having two types like that is like, oh, can I fetch it up? And yeah, yes, you can. And yes, it is actually like. Like, for instance, these cards are modern playable without question. You can life from the loam this. It's going to be such a game oh, yeah. changer. So they're not going to – they're yeah, but it's not going to be very common for you to, like, crack a wooded foothills to get Canyon Sloth, right? Well, I think you will after you've used up your other land sometimes. Yeah, it's not – Particularly since – well, no, 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 because you have the Gyptrog monster in play. 
And you want to sacrifice your canyon sloths so that when you loam, you can get back a cycling land. Yeah, but that doesn't make you get it with the wooded foothills. That's all I'm saying. They both, yes, it does. It, it, no, if you so oh, let's say you get it so that you can sacrifice it. Got right. It. Done. It's like Understood. you get to turn your fetch lands into tutors for your cycling lands, and the jit trog monster gives you a natural way to sacrifice it is them. Just like that. It is that. How can I say that literally now? Because you have literally used your fetch land as a tutor for your cycling land. Yes, and so then uh, outside of all that stuff, though. Even just in standard, this is a game changer. This is really, really, really important because, okay, you know how like right now in the old standard format, enemy wedges have better mana than uh, shards. You know, like Mardu, for instance, has better mana options available to it, or Jeskai has better mana options available to it than, for instance, Grixis or Esper. Because of cards like Botanical Sanctum. Right. The, well, it's not really about yeah, it. It, they have the good mana because they have Lumbering Falls plus Botanical Sanctum is a great combination. But if you go the other way on Esper, playing uh, so if you just play two colors, you can play uh, eight duels no problem, even if it's friendly. But if you play three colors and it's a shard, you end up with a bunch of you know you end up with like for instance Prairie Stream and Sunken Hollow alongside Choked Estuary and uh, Port Town. And while uh, Sunken Hollow and Prairie Stream untap Choked Estuary or Port Town, the Port Town and the... I'm sorry, yeah. The the Port Town and the, the Choked Estuary don't really help your Sunken Hollow or your Prairie Stream, and they get played out of order. You just end up with not enough basics... Unless you play, like, Evolving Wilds, or you just make one of the colors a very light splash, but it's just very hard. You have very, very, very constrained mana if you're playing a shard up until now. Now, this radically changes the landscape, because before, you were kind of forked in this weird spot where you want to play Choked Estuary with Sunken Hollow in your hand, but if you do you're still going to need to play two more basics before your Sunken Hollow isn't a tap land. However, with Fetid Pools and Irrigated Farmland, your Grixis, or your Esper deck, for instance, you don't have to play any basics if you don't want to. You could just play four Fetid Pools, four Irrigated Farmland, four Choked Estuary, four Port Town, and then play four uh, Shambling Vent, four Concealed Courtyard. That's 24. And then you're, and with that 24, you already have 16 of each color, and your land is going to be very smooth. But that's only 24 land total. You can still play, play four more land if you want, because you have these cycling lands anyway. You can play two more, three more, four more. And if you can make them islands, for instance, in an Esper deck, it'll untap both, you know, more of your lands. So that's nice. But if you need to, you could play plains or swamps. But the, the point is that you can very easily, for instance, with an Esper deck, have uh, 18 blue, 16 white, 16 black, and with 26 land. And lots of other one costs. Like, you can just cycle your cast out sometimes or whatever. The mana base for shards seems so good now. So good. Uh, then just a small point, right? But uh, being like a Plains Island is good good for cards like Port Town, right? You just you have one more thing to, to help get your land uh, untapped in, in an early turn. Yeah, that's the point. Is you don't play Sunken Hollow. You don't play... Prairie Stream, you play zero of each of them because you don't want to have any basics or you want to play very, very few. You're just going to rely on irrigated farmland, fetid pools, and then maybe a couple islands or whatever in order to untap all your port towns and choked estuaries. So your mana will be actually smooth, good. Uh, It'll be untapped when you want it a lot. You'll have your colors. You can play, like, more greedy of mana bases. And then what's more, you can play more land than you normally would 
because you can cycle these away. And even on top of that, it flows in the right direction. You can have fetid pools in your hand, untap your, uh, your port towns and choked estuaries, and then cycle your fetid pools when it's convenient, when you have a spot, when you have an opening. So my mind went to a different direction. Maybe this is just insane when I saw these cards. Do you think it's it's even possible to play all five and maybe like Evolving Wilds and really make Splendid Reclamation happen? Do you think that's a thing that could, you know, Johnny's are like, oh man, Splendid Reclamation. But Why would you play with all five? Just because they First of all, what basics are you going to Evolving Wilds for? I don't know, something that lets me cast my uh, Retreat and my and my Splendid Reclamation. So green and white. I don't know. Maybe you don't want Evolving Wilds. But I just don't want to get uh, lands into my graveyard. I'm not saying Evolving Wilds. I'm saying... I, okay, let's put it this way. I think you can play tons of these with Reclamation potentially in some combo deck. I don't know that you would play all five. You might. It just seems surprising. It seems like it'd be way more likely that you would play... Like, uh, maybe like 12 to 16. Like, you just end up getting glutted a little. But maybe. Like, if there's some kind of, like, fluctuator thing. But these are, like, your spells, right? Like, they're they're the thing that no, the deck is doing. No, they're not. They're, they're, they're the air. No, no, no. They're, they're air, man. They're, they're your cantrips. They're twice the cost of op for half the library manipulation. But... They're great. But they're your payoff, they're amazing- too, right? Like... In, in this deck, you want your lands into the graveyard. Well, sort of. You only want them in so far as if you get them into your graveyard, then Reclamation will give you an extra land in play. Like, it's not an intrinsic good. It's only worth as much as you can put the mana to use, you know? It's like getting, it's like, is 50 mana good? Well, it can be. So now what? It can be. Now what is that we talk about Drakehaven, man. Okay, I agree. Man, Drakehaven, this seems awesome to me. So it's two and a blue for an enchantment, and it has the text, whenever you cycle or discard a card, you may pay one if you do create a 2-2 blue Drake creature token with flying. So it's like... It's like the blue cousin of both Astral Slide and Lightning Rift. It has like... The similar baseline casting cost of Astral Slide, the additional taxation and damage potential of Lightning Rift, and a completely different character at the same time. Yeah, this card's a big deal. This is another. I mean, the, uh, this is another thing that makes main deck artifact enchantment removal look a lot more appealing. But uh, this card is a, a really big deal. This card is. Um, you don't have to make very many drakes before it's very uh, like a very big, big, big board presence. And um, the fact that you can make them at instant speed, that's exciting. And the fact that they actually get the game over with, I mean, Lightning Rift, it's very frequent. You're just like, okay, two to you, two to you, you know. This, I mean, a shock is a bigger impact on the game than uh, than, than a lot of things. But a Windrake is even more. I mean, you could block with the Windrake. But if you attack with the Windrake, you can attack over and over and over again. And then what's more, this doesn't just key off of cycling. This keys off of you discarding cards for any reason. Yeah, it's like uh, right? the Archfiend of Ifnir we talked about last week. Uh, right, and that's that's huge. I, I, the thing that's really interesting to me is like, uh, Drake Haven is like the flagship, right? It's if you play it, maybe not all the time, but I think quite often when you're playing this in constructed, it's the centerpiece of your deck. It's kind of like what your deck is about, where you would make card choices all around it in order to make it good, right? You can't play Drake like if if you were playing standard right this second, and you just lived in an imaginary world where we're playing standard, where you know Marta Vehicles and Green Black and Sahili or whatever were the main decks from the sets that we have, and you just stuck Drake Haven into it. It wouldn't be that good, right? There's not no, enough, there's not enough fuel. There's some fuel, just not enough fuel. But 
in the future, in the very near future, in the next month or two, when Drake Haven starts to become a popular card for people to play, it's going to be because they're adding all these cycling lands and and well, that's part of it. And stuff like that. That they're and those cards both make Drake Haven good once it's already in play and help you draw into the Drake Haven, which is so cool to me. I mean, that's part of it. But part of it is that Drake Haven is so good that it makes you value some of the cards that are already legal that you wouldn't be playing normally because you're not getting enough utility out of them. But if you only had Drake Haven in your deck, then suddenly, you know, Tormenting Voice and Cathartic Reunion take on a whole new meaning. Lightning Axe. When you Lightning Axe with a Drake Haven, you spend two mana, and then you just end up with a 2-2 Flyer. And that's not even counting if the cards you discarded had madness or graveyard interaction. Yeah, like you brain a it dragon. <laughs> okay. it it's, so it, work, it, it works with Cathartic Reunion, Crit Breaker. It works with uh, uh, Nahiri, the Harbinger. It works with Oath of Jace. And you can pay two. right? Like you don't have to just get one Drake. You can get two Drakes if you discard two cards. So, like, this is a, uh, this is, you know, definitely a format staple, linchpin, flagship, one of the most important cards in the set, probably. Yeah, I think it's it's spectacular. I think that it's likely to be the case that there will be at least one archetype that comes into to standard off of this that has no other way to win than Drake Havens. Mm -hmm. and Dude, if this with Noose Constrictor... That's like, that's pretty intense, man. Oh, I mean, if you like, just have a, if you just have a Drake Haven in play, like, it's so unbelievably good what you can do with Noose Constrictor. Anything, anything that just lets you discard these cards. I don't know. This card seems crazy. Yeah, like you could just um actually. You could just like slam with Noose Constrictor, discard your hand. And then Delayed Blast Fireball them, basically, right? Because you get, like, four 2-2 two -two Flyers, and you hit them for six or something. Go. Uh, well, keep in mind, you can do stuff like... You can actually up the ante. You can go even harder core than News Constrictor. Imagine with Olivia. Uh, mobilized for War. Yep. If you Olivia mobilized for War, you can, like, play your creature... Discard a card to give it plus one, plus one, and make it have haste because it's a vampire now. And then you pay one because you want to make a 2-2 two -two Drake. And then now that you have the Drake, discard another card. You can just make three, three haste creatures for one mana and a card each. That's kind of... That is crazy. That's, yeah, that's right, kind like of that, like really powerful. That's a lot. And both That's cards are, like, okay, right? Like, Drake Haven is a good card. Olivia's, like, a better than good, but just hasn't been really discovered yet card. Put them together. Stuff could happen. If you have Alms, whatever that, you know, the of the Bloodline or whatever the... Not Alms, but the Call the Bloodline. Call the Bloodline? The Vampire yeah, thing? Yeah, right. So you can play Call on turn two and then Drake Haven on turn three. And now every two mana you spend... And discard one card, Three you get a 1-1 one, one lifelink and a 2-2 two, two flyer. That's pretty good for two mana and a card. And you could just do this at will, add it to speed once per turn. On each of your turns, your turn, your opponent's turn. That's, anyway, and that's not even counting if you cycle cards. Heaven forbid you cycle cards. But uh, something else I wanted to mention and cast out before we uh, gloss past it again. You can cast out in your Felidar Guardian deck and potentially move the cast out by Felidar Guardian in order to blink the cast out. You know, like you can go, I'm going to cast out your random thing, and then later they play a bigger thing, and you're like, okay, I'm going to Felidar Guardian, blink my cast out, and now I'm casting out something better. Or, or like uh, another option, you could like cast out their Hardy Kieran, and then they play another Hardy Kieran. And you go, Felidar Guardian, I'm going to move my cast out from off your Hardy Kieran and onto your Gideon. Or whatever, you know? Yeah, that's doable. So anyway, uh, Drake Haven seems like 
a big, 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 big deal. Um, um, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, like, hey, we want to move on to another permanent yeah. card that costs two and a U. Might be a, might be something to talk about. Okay. Kefnir the Mindful. Sure. So Kefnir the Mindful is two and a blue. Uh, legendary creature god, 5-5, five, five, and they knew what they were doing. Yeah. They want this, They knew what they were doing. So Kefnir the Mindful, 2 and a blue, 5-5, five, five, flying indestructible. Kefnir the Mindful can't attack or block unless you have seven or more cards in hand. And it has 3 and a blue, colon, draw a card, then you may return a land you control to its owner's hand. The first thing is, this is just, this is better than pyramids. You know the uh, Arabian Night anti-land destruction card that costs six and two to activate? No, I didn't even know there was such a card. <laughs> yeah, pyramid's pretty good. It's six cost artifact. You put it into play, and it's poly. It's a poly artifact, so you can just... Now you can pay two mana to uh, prevent one of your lands from being destroyed until on a turn. I think it's odd that they would in, in in a world where people had sinkholes, right? Well, it's, it's kind of nice that that, that it, they would make it, this thing cost six. And it, it also, it, well, it, it has other utility too. You can also uh, destroy, like, if your opponent has cursed land on your land or psychic venom, because it's you know it's two colorless activation, not even tap either. You can just pay two colorless at will. To prevent, uh, you know, the next time when your lands would be destroyed, uh, it doesn't. And uh, the next time, like, or if you wanted, you could alternatively destroy all of the uh, psychic venoms on it or whatever. Actually, it's not even destroy all. It just can remove one. So if they put three psychic venoms on one on your, like, you know, your uh, island of whack whack, then you can you can use pyramid to destroy, you know, one each turn. Now, it's unfortunately, though, Pyramid is not legal. Um, but fortunately, we have something even better. Kefnir the Mindful, while it does cost three and a blue to activate, uh, it only costs three to cast instead of six, which is a big deal against land destruction. Uh, additionally, <laughs> addi now, no, it's, you know... It's, it's, it is a big deal. I mean, on the play, like, if, <laughs> if Stone Rain were legal, you'd be able to get under the Stone Rain. Sure. Now, a nice, the other nice thing about this one is that it's a 5-5 five, five flying indestructible. For three. And, and it also draws cards uh, you know, every time you use the ability. Because remember, balancing the land is optional. So this is actually just like a much better treasure trove in general. Yeah, now, it's indestructible too, right? It's, this thing's pretty cool. And it's worth noting, this one is always a creature. It's not that it only becomes a creature if you have seven or more cards in hand? Yeah, it's just, like, not that useful of a creature unless you have seven really? more cards. Really? Well, you really? could fling it. You could do other stuff like that. But like, it what? Like, do I don't know. Wait, 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 wait. wait. You, you couldn't crew a vehicle? You could crew a vehicle. You could crew a pretty big ride, right? Like, Kefnir, the mindful, gets down. I mean, like, for instance, the red one um, has a red, the fervent despite what it's uh masterpiece or whatever it's, it's might masterpiece be. is uh, it's, it's it's a masterpiece unfortunate some, i think in it's so hazarat hazarat is uh three in a red for a five four indestructible haste that can't attack or block unless you have one or fewer cards in your hand and then it has an activated ability of two in a red and discard a card, Hazaret deals two damage to each opponent. So if you have Hazaret, and you if you just drop Hazaret and you have one or fewer cards, you can just attack with your 5-4 Indestructible Haste immediately. And you're just already there. And every turn, regardless of what you draw, you could just discard it. So it's like you're doing seven a turn, right? But you can also use Hazaret to crew... Uh, you know, to crew a lot of things. If you if it teams up with a Thraven Inspector, you've already got enough to open up Seven Eleven. So I I I don't know. I think that's kind of interesting. Just being able to crew a vehicle is like that's a legit thing, you know. Or Heart of Kieran. You know, somebody's got to crew the Heart of Kieran. Why not Hazaret? 
But uh, in terms of Kefnir the Mindful, Kefnir the Mindful is a uh, it's a it's better it's a treasure trove, but it costs one less to cast and it's easier on your blue. Plus, it has the option. He has tons of options. So here's some things you can do. Let's say the game's going long. You can attack with your wandering fermerol. And if they kill it, you can blink it back to your hand and draw a card. That's pretty good, right? That's cool. Okay, here's another thing. And this is really niche. But sometimes you're going to need a second color. And you're going to have it like that. You know, like you're going to have... Like, for instance, if you've got Kefnir... You're going to pick up your hub? You can pick up your hub. You could even pick up a single planes in order to cast a double white spell. By going white, I'll tap four islands, pick up my planes, white again. You can pick up Battle for Zendikar lands. You know, like that skyline, the shoreline ridge or whatever. The oh, tap. Instead of like a cool ability when they come yeah. into play. The blue nice. one, when it comes into play, locks something down. If you Kefnir the Mindful, you can blink that land every turn and lock something down every turn. That's kind of cool for your jam day tone to have as an option. Right? Like, yeah. I mean, one of the things I think is important about this card is, let's say you play it and you have four cards in hand, right? You could just pretty much get to the point that you can attack with it the next turn, right? That's pretty much just what happens. Well, if you want, but you're not always trying to attack, man. Sometimes you just want to establish control, you know? Like, you don't always just attack with your 5-5 five, five flying indestructible and pick all your land up first chance you get in your blue deck. Sometimes it's nice to just ride the tome until you're ready. You can just have, like, four or five cards, and your opponent might not be able to attack anymore, right? You're just like, eh. Yeah. Because this it's not like he goes anywhere. It's just, I remember LSV once told me about when you're playing Swans of Brynargol. Like, there's a downside to Swans, right? But you when you play it and you tap out against most decks, you pretty much won't lose. Like, that that's, that was the thing. You know? He's a really good stop sign. Uh, right, because if you have five cards in your hand... If they attack, you could pick up the land. Yeah. And then if they don't attack, you don't even need to pick up the land. You can just draw the extra card and then get up to seven on the next turn by drawing a card natural. And, I mean, yeah, you obviously have a developmental loss by picking up a land. You're a blue deck, right? That's probably not what you want to be doing. But if you're trading picking up a land for, like, four mana worth of stuff, that could be great, right? And maybe it sets you up for your next turn because, like, you do that, and then you just, all right, I've got these seven cards. Before I play my land, I'm just going to kill your Gideon. You know, so something like that. And then, all right, I play my land, and you're untapped, more or less. I think you uh, I think you have something going on with this guy. I, I, I you, can, you, can really bounce, you can bounce your own cycling lands. You know, like if you just got it like that. Uh, I think that you can, but I think that's going to be a weird pinch situation, right? Because... Going backwards in your mana development when you have a poly ability to just draw cards, I think, like, you'd have to have well, a pretty weird reason to want to do that. No, like, for instance, let's say that you just have six mana available. Or not even six mana. Let's just say that they exile it. They they play cast out on your whatever, on this uh, on this god, on Kefnet. And then you're like, okay, well, I only get to activate Kefnet once. If you only get to activate Kefnet once... You could easily want to pick up your cycling land. Or, like, let's say it's so the ability is draw a card, comma, then you may return a land you can draw. Right. So, so let's say, like, you're in a situation similar to what you just said, right? So I, I'm, I don't know what the exact amount of mana would be. I, obviously, I could figure it out. But uh, let's just assume that there's a, a, a fixed amount of mana that you need to be able to execute this. You have a Drake Haven and a Kefnet, and you determine that you can only you can only survive this turn if you can activate the Drake Haven, right? You could... Draw the card with Kefnet, and then see if you get a cycling card, right? And if you don't, you can pick up a you can have tapped a cycling land in order to uh, to execute the ability. And then just like, all right, I didn't draw a cycling card, so I'm not going to pick up the cycling land and then uh, utilize yep. it in order to. Execute. You could do that. Yeah, if you if you had seven mana available, you could just go. Okay, I'll pay four. Let's see if I get a cycling card. Oh, I didn't. Okay, then I'll pick up the cycling land, cycle it, and Drake even make a blocker. Yeah. Another option is you can just discard a hand size because you're like, okay, well, I'll 
draw an extra card, and now I got enough cards. I'll attack with Kefnet, discard the hand size, trigger my Drake Haven. That's kind of cool, right? Yeah. There's so much stuff you can do with Kefnet. You know, and here's here's another part of it. Here's another part. Uh, you know what you can do to Jamie Tome and Treasure Trove? You can disenchant them. You can't disenchant Kefnet. Kefnet is literally an indestructible tome. Yeah, I think Kefnet is going to be... I think he's going to be a thing. I think it's another card like Drakehaven where he's just going to... Maybe he'll be a loner, right? He's a he's a legendary creature to begin with, but he's indestructible. And like maybe just like... Kefnet's my guy. I don't have any other guys, right? Like he, he's, he does all the stuff I need him to do. I think that's possible. Because he's, he's kind of a weird guy. Like he kind of seems like... You'd want to play him with spells, but I can also imagine a situation where you want to play him with other guys, you know, so they can do things like crew a vehicle, you know, get get together to attack. Also, he's only a single blue, so maybe you play him in a red green deck or something, an otherwise aggressive deck. Who knows? Yep yeah, this this is a this is a big game. Um, so you want to look at one more card? All right, last one. Uh, you know, we could always save it. I mean, if there's all I was going to suggest is, uh, what do you think of, uh, God, where's, where is this card? Um, the zombie thing. No, I, mean, I guess we, of, no, no, I mean, oh, go, go ahead. I thought that Temet Vizier of Nak. Yeah, the one that, that it powers itself up. It's like blue white for a two, two and it has balm of five. Uh, and then it also has the ability, it's a legend, it has the ability of, uh, the beginning, you know, when it attacks, not even when it attacks, just the beginning of combat, it gives one of your tokens plus one plus one and can't be blocked this turn, which could work on itself when it's in, you know, when, when it's, it's in embalm mode. Yeah, when it's been on the, uh, the, the embalming fluid. So, um, is the, so the, the token is also a legend, right? So you can't, yep. like, I mean, you could do this, but it wouldn't be productive, right? To have a Temet, play a second Temet. Get rid of one of the Temets and then flash it back. Then that, that doesn't that doesn't do anything for you, right? Like you just still have a Temet and you spent a card and like seven mana for nothing, right? Because it's still a legend. Who knows? <laughs> uh, so what do you think about? It? I think this card is like. On one hand, I'm like I think the Embalm is pretty expensive for what you're getting. But I still think people would play this. I think it seems like a really good card, and I can already imagine a bunch of situations where I might want to play it. So, Yeah, I think the fact that it has haste is kind of interesting, too. right? Like, if you just make a token, if you have anything that just makes a token, you know, like, for instance, even your freaking Gideon token, right? If you just make a token by any reasonable path, you can play Temet and then immediately give your token plus one, plus one, and unblockable. And then do that every turn. So yeah. it's like a watch wolf worth of damage, but you're getting some of the haste in. Not even just one point of haste, you're also making your Gideon token unblockable. Like, this card could be tactically awesome against Planeswalkers. Yeah, I was thinking like, or A, of course I agree, but B, I was thinking like maybe some kind of Bant Company decks in, in, in Modern, right? Like, A, it's already interesting to play in any kind of situation where you're just going to be getting creatures into the graveyard, right? Uh, because of its embalm. But... If you combine it with, like, Voice of... Is it Voice of Resurgence? Is that the name of it? That yeah. Is like, a big big token? Yeah. Like, so many games in Modern just come down to people chump-blocking the other guy's Voice of Resurgence token. Because, like, it's so big. Like, just making that guy unblockable at such a low cost because it's just a card you would play, right? That seems like a... I guess I just won. Like, here's my 7-7. Seven, seven. He has plus one, plus one, and you can't block him. Um... I don't know. It seemed like just an obvious synergy to me because that, that's a token that that often gets big. But there are other tokens that are just like way outside. It's like I think that a lot of the time we think about tokens as just being these you know one one creatures that you get multiple of uh, for for one card or one effect you know or come with an Eldrazi or come with a you know a, you know it's just some sort of add on ability from a, a Nissa that's like not quite a card but it's generating some value to, to block you but that's just not the only kind of token, right? So there's there's tokens like Voice of Resurgence, or I guess Dark Depths is a is a terrible example because it has so many other things going for it. But that that are just big, and that you would. I mean, play. even even there, even just like uh, there's that green white play a three three token, right? Like there's some weird stuff 
you might just be able to uh, call the conclave. Is that the one you're talking? Yeah, call the conclave. Like also, there's some planeswalkers that make great tokens when they first come down. You know. Yeah. So. I think I think I, 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 think, that, I think the card's good. Cool. Yeah. Very cool card. All right. All right. Awesome, man. So I say goodbye and goodbye to all our listeners, but we're going to be back in like it depends when you're listening to this, but like 24 hours Third. from now. Yep. Another episode. Uh, in the meantime, if you like this, you know, subscribe on iTunes or I don't know wherever you would subscribe. Uh, where is there else? Uh, YouTube, you could subscribe. <laughs> um, all right, dude. We're top we're of the podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, etc. We'll be back in one day. All right, awesome. See you guys then. Tried to play dredge, use a jailer haze. Mostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis, please. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a vault with nothing but time. Parents and my friends were the key to find. Magic gave me purpose and drive. The game, the love, it kept me alive.